And there was another, as well as the Montreal lab that sends their prototypes that you'd be playing with in the moment, there was another person that wanted to be here and couldn't, and so he sent us a game to play. Oh, oh no, we had Joe say earlier, but do, would you like to say something now? Yeah, one more thing, why not? And Joe, with you, Joe. Thank you. Um, I guess just another um, issue just arising from that video was the um, uh, the lab as a space of um, to combat forms of oppression in some ways, whether that's oppression of knowledge or oppression of participation. And I guess a provocation um, I'd like to offer um, is... Um, on what terms does this participation happen? If it is a site of exchange, how is that exchange facilitated? Um, and is it geared towards a particular outcome? Um, if, the, if the only outcome is exchange, then that is potentially um, quite positive. But then if the lab certainly has a, um agenda to create new pedagogies, as we heard um, in the video, then maybe there has to be a kind of framework where the function of the lab is clearly stated to so those who participate in it have they understand the rules of the game to mix my metaphors um, and that they can contribute meaningfully to it but then all can also add to it as well so the game or the place of exchange is formed by them as well and so this is kind of like i understand it as a kind of a fluidic structure and just thinking about this again in terms of digital culture, it's a kind of fluidic information structure where the lab provides the architecture for the exchange to happen, but the information that circulates within it is always being regenerated and reproduced and transformed, um, which is, to me, is a very exciting type of learning without being utopian. Certainly in the kind of education culture we have now, where as a wannabe academic, I'm forced to say what my outcome would be of my research. It wouldn't be true research if I knew what the outcome was. And I think the outcome would be poorer for it.